This meeting is now being recorded. Today, George Lewis is going to be talking to us about um, the Aegis Missile Defense System and how it may affect uh, future nuclear arms reductions. Uh, and I should just say this is something that George and I and a few others have been working on for many years. And, you know, in fact, one of the uh, figures he's going to show is something we made 22 years ago. So it's interesting to see it's still relevant. George. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. Um, although current prospects for further U.S.-Russian nuclear arms reductions look bleak, there's always a possibility that in the future, if relations improve, then we might be able to resume these reductions. But what I want to argue today is that time may be running out on that, because the U.S. is soon going to introduce a weapon that will make, I think, such re reductions much more difficult, and specifically that's the naval SM-3 Block 2A interceptor. Um, it's long been recognized that as long as nations rely on nuclear-armed ballistic missiles for for nuclear deterrence and large-scale deployments of strategic-capable defenses will be fundamentally incompatible with deep nuclear reductions. And when I say strategic-capable here, I'm talking in the U.S.-Russian context, that is, I'm talking about intercontinental range missiles. And in the 60s and 70s, just the threat of possible defense deployments let, contributed to significant buildup in missile forces by uh, deploying multiple warheads on the missiles. And the problems recognized, and that led to the negotiation of the ABM Treaty in 1972, which strictly limited defense deployments. Uh, since then, although there have been some defense deployments, so far they've not been big enough to pose a threat to existing nuclear forces, and so they haven't really exist, haven't really affected nuclear deployments. Um, just to step back, in the second half of the 1990s, there was a big controversy in the U.S. over deployment of a national missile defense system that is a defense of U.S. territory. And one of the key, I mean, and this was settled by, by the election of George Bush in 2000, who was clearly going to go ahead with a national missile defense system, which he started to build in 2002. And one of the key arguments against the National Missile Defense System during the debate was that at a minimum it would prevent further U.S.-Russian nuclear weapon reductions or possibly even provoke buildups. And that didn't happen. As, as you can see here, we've had uh, two significant arms reduction, nu strategic nuclear arms reductions uh, uh, following the beginning of U.S. deployment. Um, and in fact, to the extent that Russia and China complain about U.S. missile defenses, they mostly complain about the regional deployments that cannot, which don't directly counter their uh, their strategic offensive forces. Um, and, and one reason why this has been, as I mentioned, is that U.S. national missile defense have remained very limited. To put this in perspective. Uh, during the Clinton administration, a plan for a missile, national missile defense system was developed, the so-called 3 plus 3 system. And in the final and third, the third and final phase of that system, which if they had decided to proceed, obviously they didn't, would probably be being deployed today, it would have had 250 interceptors, eight or nine large X-band discrimination radars, and a space-based tracking system. That's vastly more than what we have today, which is about 34 interceptors, which are so unreliable that they're basically going to scrap them and replace them, and only a single, not very reliable, uh, X-band radar. So the deployments so far have been truly limited. Um, let's see. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to skip that. Uh, the U.S. is also deploying a number of theater missile defenses. Uh, we have about 33 ships today equipped with the Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense System, which I'm going to talk more about. We have uh, five 
terminal high altitude area defense, or THAAD batteries, which will grow to seven in a couple of years, and um, and 60 uh, Patriot batteries. Um, and but so far, there is a pretty clear distinction between these systems and national missile defense. Although Aegis and THAAD, the current interceptors, in principle can intercept intercontinental range missiles, the area that they can cover is so small that it would not be practical, for example, to use them as a defense of U.S. territory. George, since not, maybe not everybody uh, is familiar with these, do you just want to say a word about uh, THAAD and Patriot and what they're developed, what, you know, what they've been developed to do? Patriot has been developed to deal with miss, with short-range missiles up to about maybe 1,500 kilometers. Um, it intercepts within the atmosphere. It's, it can be used for both air defense and missile defense. That is an Army system uh, basically nominally intended for, for missiles of up ranges up to three or 4,000 kilometers, but it's capable of more than that and can cover an area of sort of the size of a European country kind of size area. Um, to, let me talk more about Aegis, though, because that's the one I want to focus on here. Let's skip that. All right, so the Aegis ships are destroyers and cruisers equipped with the SPY-1 radar, a powerful four-phase 360-degree radar, 90 to 122 vertical launch cells, depending on the ship, and the Aegis computer combat system. And the U.S. has about 84 Aegis ships today. We are upgrading these ships. The basic Aegis system is not capable of intercepting ballistic missiles. However, we are upgrading ships to give them this capability. As the Navy refers to the ships currently as having either a basic, intermediate, or advanced capability. Uh, and the advanced capability, which is what I'm going to focus on here mostly, are, are able to perform air defense and missile defense simultaneously. We only have a few of those so far, about four, I believe, today. The other Aegis ships with a basic or intermediate capability, when they leave port, they must be configured for either air defense or missile defense, but not both, uh, which is obviously a significant limitation. Uh, it is not to say that a ship equipped from, configured for missile defense is completely helpless against aircraft because they have non-Aegis short-range uh, air defense system like the phalanx gun system. Um, today, the Navy, the Navy, U.S. Navy has a current requirement that's, you know, an official requirement for 40 advanced capability Aegis BMD ships. And these break down as four for the European phased adaptive approach, nine for basing in Japan, and 27 for as part of carrier battle groups. And the Navy says they will be able to meet this requirement in about 2026 by upgrading ships and building new ones. Uh, on the other hand, regional combat commanders put in requests for ships, and the request for ballistic missile ships is growing very rapidly. As you can see here, it went from 42 in 2014 to 77 in 2016. So there's a lot of demand for this ballistic missile defense capability. Okay, if you look at Aegis ships in terms of uh, which ships are being upgraded, new construction, planned retirements, and the modernization of the cruisers, you can project how many ships there are going to be in the future. And this shows my projection. Um, the square show any Aegis BMD capability, and the um, circles show uh, the advanced capability. And this shows... Don't, George, you, I think you just said that backwards. You said it the opposite of what's on the plot. Right, I did say the opposite. The circles are all, and the squares are advanced. Okay. Thank you. 
Do you think by 20, about the mid 2030s, they'll be in the 70s of ships, and all of them will be um, advanced capability? And I should say that since I've made this slide, they have increased these numbers by three. So this num these numbers are actually low by three at some point. Um, This. Uh, so let me talk about the interceptors. Um, we have um, a number of different type of PMD interceptors deployed at the moment. So there's a small number of the Navy's older long-range air defense system, the SM-2 Block 4, that have been given a minimal missile defense capability. Uh, obviously, these only operate in the atmosphere and probably against relatively short-range missiles. The Navy's new long-range air defense interceptor is known as the SM-6, of which we've already got a substantial number deployed. Modifications, basically software modifications to these, known as the Dual 1 and Dual 2, uh, will give these things uh, some BMD capability. Again, this is a within the atmosphere capability. Uh, there's going to be, since this is the primary air defense weapon, long range air defense weapon, there's going to be a lot of these missiles. Uh, plans call for 1,800 by 2024. Probably not all of these will be BMD capability, but likely a large fraction of them will. Um, the better known for missile defense uh, missile, the missile that's designed explicitly for missile defense is the SM-3. And this is an above the atmosphere interceptor with a infrared homing kill vehicle. So it works in the same way as the GBI interceptor of the National Missile Defense System. The current version is the block B, SM-1, uh, block A and B. The B is in the process of phase, A is in the process of being phased out and for Block 1B. Uh, as I'll show you, we have about 200 of these today. This is going to rise to about 400 in the mid 2020s. Uh, and the missile I'm focusing on here is the next generation missile, the SM3 Block 2A. This is a, high, a much higher speed missile, uh, which has significant implications for, for, in particular, the area it can cover. It was supposed to have its first test in October, first intercept test in October. Uh, that still hasn't happened. I don't know what the reason for the delay is. But it's scheduled to begin deployment at the Polish EPAA site uh, by the end of 2018. And there was formerly a higher speed, even higher speed version, the Block 2B, that was canceled a few years ago. So about the Block 2A interceptor. So as I say, it's a higher speed, four and a half kilometers per second, than the Block 1, which was about three. It's being co-developed and produced with Japan. It has much greater capabilities than the um, Block 1B or 1A. It, as you see here, has double the seeker sensitivity and more than triple the divert capability of the Block 1B. In that comparison, it's worth remembering that even the 1A version in 2008 was used to shoot down a satellite. So this thing is not going to have any trouble with the speed of ICBM warheads. Um, and if it were deployed in Europe, it, it can't intercept Russian or Iranian ICBMs. Um, as this figure shows, you can see here it shows the Aegis BMD intercept window against full range 10,000 kilometer ICBMs. It can't intercept at the, at the, over the peak of the mid course because it can't simply fly high enough. This means that it's going to it's going to be used to intercept ICBMs either going up as it's close to the launch site or more relevant to us as it's coming down. And because it intercepts coming down, that means there's a long, means the missile is in flight for a long time, the threat missile. 
which means the target missile also has a long time to fly, which means it's going to have um, um, if, uh, be able to cover a very large range given given the fly out time. So what I'm going to argue here is that if it's deployed near U.S. territory, it has potentially significant capabilities against ICBMs. Now, what I'm not saying when I say potentially significant capabilities, I'm not saying that it's necessarily going to be effective it, it, because it operates in the same way as the National Missile Defense System. It has the same vulnerability to countermeasures as the National Missile Defense System. So when I say potentially significant, I mean capabilities similar to that of the National Missile Defense Interceptors. Um, this is just a figure that Yusuf Bud and Ted Postal put together showing some intercepts. You can see that the interceptors are capable of flying quite far inland and actually much further than are shown in this figure. This is the figure uh, David mentioned at the beginning produced by uh, he and I and Elizabeth and Ted Postal uh, back in 1994. And it illustrates for a four and a half kilometer per second interceptor, which is about what the Block 2A will be, that the entire U.S. can be covered from a small number of offshore locations. We didn't know it at the time, but a couple of years earlier, the Missile Defense Agency had produced a rather similar plot. This is the Missile Defense Agency uh, figure from 1992 showing the U.S. again being covered by a small number of uh, naval interceptors, although the exact speed wasn't specified. A more recent figure, which says it's based on Lincoln Laboratory analysis, specifically for Block 2, uh, shows footprints very similar to the ones that they showed that we had calculated earlier. Uh, so there's little doubt that Block 2A interceptors, if deployed near U.S. territory, off U.S. shores, could in principle provide coverage of the entire country against ICBMs. Um, so this brings us to the next question. How many of these interceptors are there going to be? Um, one issue for this interceptor is it's expensive. As you can see here on the bottom, costs about twice as much as the Block 1B. So possibly you might argue that maybe the Navy will show some restraint and instead focus on Block 1Bs rather than 2As. I think that's extremely unlikely for several reasons. Uh, first, the Block 2A covers a much larger area, um, as is illustrated in this figure for the 1B versus the, the 2A. This gives ship, if a ship has to cover some inland location, this allows it to have much greater operational flexibility, which is something that's very attractive to the Navy. Uh, it may have greater effectiveness in the, B, the 1B because of its greater sensor sensitivity and greater divert capability. And its higher speed allows it to be launched later than the Block 1B, which increases what they call as the um, battle space, uh, which would make more possible, uh, um, more efficient strategies, such as shoot, look, shoot strategies. Um, oops, wrong way. So this is the number of SM-3 interceptors based on official data for as far out as they go, which, depending on the missile, is between 22 and 24. Uh, you can see the Block 1A interceptors here, the diamonds, these are already being phased out. The Block 1B are still growing rapidly. But these are likely to uh, peak at about 400. There's no official number yet, but it looks like it's going to come in at 400 or slightly above. Whereas the Block 2As are just in the early to mid 2020s beginning to be deployed in significant numbers. So the question is, where is this curve going to go? Um, so
so as I said, there's no formal number even for the block 1B yet, uh, and much less for the block 2A. There is a report from the GAO in April that mentions the number 351 for block 2A. My guess is that is just a number that goes through the date that they were provided data for, and my guess is the actual deployment is going to be bigger than that. The one number we do have is that the current plan is to buy 182 Block 2As to support the European phase adaptive approach, uh, and that, that would allow 96 to be deployed. Uh, that would support deploying a total of 96.48 on at the two uh, Aegis Ashore sites and 48 on the four ships. Um, another way to try to estimate, there's several other ways we can try to estimate the numbers. One is to assume that once you stop building 1Bs, you divert the money you were spending on them to building additional two A's. If you do that, then you get equilibrium numbers for the number of block two A's, as I show here, from 590 to 735. The 590 assumes a 12-year life, and 735 a 15-year life. Another way, way you might look at it is to take the fact that the 48, the four EPAA Aegis destroyers will have a total of 48 Block 2As. If you assume the same loading on the other advanced Aegis PMD ships, uh, that would be 10 times more or, or about close to 500. And those four Aegis destroyers, as I mentioned, are only about 5% of the total, which is now going to be about 80 uh, Aegis advanced capability ships eventually in which case the number could be even twice that. George, just to make sure I understand, uh, you're saying that four of these ships would be devoted to the European defense system, and the yes. rest of them would be de deployable elsewhere in the globe? Yes. Yeah, okay. So it's a relatively small number of the destroyers that are actually tied to, to uh, Europe. Right. Okay, another way to look at it is these missiles are stored and launched from the vertical launch systems on the cruisers and destroyers. Each destroyer has between 90 and 96, depending on when it was built, launch tubes. Uh, the cruisers have more, but the cruisers are likely going to go away before too long. Uh, currently, those launch tubes share six different kinds of weapons an anti-submarine missile, tomahawk, land attack missiles, and a variety, several different air defense missiles, and then the missile defense interceptors. But if you deployed a total of 500 SM-3 Block 2As, that would only occupy 6.5% of the total slots. So again, that's suggestive that the numbers could be, could be as large as 500 or even more. Um, Okay, so to summarize what I've said so far, uh, under current plans, the number of advanced Aegis capability ships will begin to increase rapidly. I mean, a pace of about three to four per year, starting in about 2017. That's you get four for which, because starting in about uh, 2023, new construction ships will start to enter the fleet, and if you assume two upgrade ships each year, which seems to be the plan. You get to about four per year. Uh, most likely, these will have at least 400 to 500 Block 2As deployed on them by the mid-2030s. Uh, if you add in the GMD system, which could go close to 100 if we do an East Coast site, uh, you're going to have at least 500, 600, possibly more U.S. strategic-capable interceptors. If you assume half the Russian ICBM force is survivable, then you have about 750 survivable Russian warheads. So now you're in a situation in which the number of Russian survivable nuclear warheads is roughly comparable to the number of interceptors. And I think it's fair to ask if uh, further reductions would be possible. 
at that point. Uh, when the Russians signed the New START Treaty, you can see this uh, unilateral statement they made uh, in 2010, that the START Treaty may be effective and viable only in conditions where there is no qualitative and quantitative buildup in the missile defense capabilities of the United States. At the time the state, they made this statement, they had roughly 50 missile warheads for each U.S. interceptor. So about 1,500 warheads and 30 interceptors. Um, now, if that one goes down to one-to-one, -one, I would speculate that, that that would be a severe problem for them. Certainly, I think it's clear that if the roles were reversed, this would be an absolute, and the U.S. had a number of uh, warheads equal to the number of Soviet interceptors, that, that would be an absolutely unacceptable situation to the U.S. And I don't see that uh, any reason to think the Russians believe differently. Um, a few other considerations that tend to point to this being a problem is, is that the, Rex, the last two arms reductions, in particular New START, was possible in large part because the Russians economy and deteriorating state of their forces was such that they would have had to reduce to about the new start levels anyway. That is no longer the case. Uh, in fact, it's now possible that they're going to have to uh, to eliminate some forces they would otherwise kept to meet the new start limits. Um, China is going to be not only worried by the fact that this U.S. Uh, strategic interceptor force is much larger than their ICBM force, but they're definitely going to see it as a regional threat as well. Uh, by 2018, there'll be eight U.S. BMD ships in Japan, and Japan plans on, currently has six, and plans on increasing that to eight. But I think also very importantly is the U.S. simply doesn't seem to take Russian and Chinese concerns about this seriously. To the U.S., this, this has nothing nothing to do with Russia and China. It's about Iran and North Korea and the like. And as long as the U.S. doesn't take their concerns seriously, it, the U.S. is simply going to proceed with this until they get to the point where uh, Russia and China really feel they have to do something about it. So I think that indicates it has the potential to be a, a real disaster. Um, what could be done about this. Uh, possibly the U.S. could, if it ever recognizes this is a problem, could scale back its planned deployments. Um, I think that's extremely unlikely, both because uh, the U.S. doesn't recognize this as a problem and because the Navy really sees a lot of positive and desirable uh, features about these missiles. Uh, you, you could try putting operational limits on the just BMD ships such that they can't you know, such so, so as mostly deploying them where they can't protect U.S. territory. But that's not practical either since most of the ships are home ported in exactly the places they need to be. Uh, plus, the Navy would never accept uh, limits on where it puts its ships, can take its ships. You could try to put limits on testing, for example, not testing Block 2As against ICBMs. I, I don't think that's going to convince anybody because look at our GMD system which has been officially highly effective against ICBMs for more than a decade, but has never been tested against one. Uh, I don't think there's any real prospect of incorporating these into nuclear arms agreements, as some have suggested, because the U.S. sees them as basically having nothing to do with Russian nuclear weapons. And even if it did recognize that there was a link, it would require the U.S if these were incorporated into, except a lower number of nuclear warheads from the Russians, which isn't going to be successful. Uh, cooperation on defenses. Uh, the U.S. has never played more than lip service and offering uh, transparency measures, and I don't see that changing. Uh, one possibility is Russia and China could emphasize other delivery systems. For example, if they converted their... Uh, ICBMs and SLVMs, warheads to hypersonic boost glide vehicles, they, those 
would instantly neutralize these defenses. I'm not sure that's something we want to encourage them to do, though. And I think trying to make this list, what it really does is emphasize how big of a problem this deployment's going to be. Okay, one final slide is how is – oh, I went the wrong way. No, I didn't. All right, what's going on here? One. Yes. So what does the, does the election of Trump have anything to say about this? Trump says he will develop a state-of-the-art missile defense system. The only specifics he's given on this are, in fact, specifics that apply to the Aegis BMD. Uh, two points. One is the current Navy plan is for a future fleet of 308 ships. Trump says he's going to approach this to a, increase this to about 350. The Congressional Research Service says going to 350 ships would increase the number of uh, what they call large surface combatants by about 12. So that would be basically 12 additional Aegis destroyers, all of which would be BMD capable. So that would take your total from about 80 to 90. Uh, Trump also says he's going to modernize their na nation's naval cruisers to provide ballistic missile defense capabilities. That, I'll just take a second to explain that. We have 22 Aegis cruisers, five of which have a BMD capability. Under current plans, all of those will lose that capability by the mid-2020s. Uh, five of, four of them, because they're going to undergo modernization, that will result, result in them losing that capability, and one because it's going to be retired. So if he follows through on that, that could increase the number of ships by perhaps 10 or more. Um, and that's where I'll stop. And I just have some links here to, to more detailed explanations and also citations and references. Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I have a, uh, a couple questions. One is, um, why are they taking the BMD capability off of the cruisers? Is it because they're – Money. It's cheaper to modernize them without the BMD capability. And they're assuming they'll have enough other ships that they don't need it for these. They don't Apparently, need I mean, the, you know, they're, they're way below their requirement, as I, as I mentioned, and the demand's just going to go up. I think it's a pure money issue. They just can't afford to do it mm -hmm. without, talking... without giving up something else. When you talked about um, not all of the Aegis being advanced capability, meaning they have both air and missile defense, what's the difference between them? How, the ones that don't have that capability, why don't they have both? Is it the? It's the computer systems, primarily. It's the way they've been upgraded. I mean, the original first ones that the, you may recall, the original first ones that were deployed didn't have a defense capability. They only had the ability to track missiles and relay that information. And then they added an ability to intercept missiles, but only when it was operating in a special mode. And they have improved it step by step by step. But it's only in the very newest ships that they've gotten to the point where the computer system is capable of doing both simultaneously. And, and upgrading that computer system is a big deal? Yes, it's expensive. Okay. I, I would... I think it's 50, mil, 50 to 100 million okay. per ship. Uh, and one final question I had was: I assume that when they talk about going to the to the, the uh, uh, block two A's, the reasoning for the reasoning that is for the higher speed is to get longer operational range, right? As opposed to dealing and and what comes along with that is this ability to deal with longer range incoming missiles, right? But I, I assume that the okay, and um, I mean I'm, I'm thinking about the the decision to cancel Block Two B, and whether at some point that's going to be back on the table. Oh, I think it will be. I mean, you're already seeing references to the Block Two A plus. Um, uh huh. I I think it's very likely that there will be a higher speed, even higher speed version. Okay. 
All right, I have two people on the on the line here. Uh, let's start with Mark. Uh, let me unmute you. Go ahead. You have uh, well, okay. I was. I, I can. Say. Yes, I, I was wondering when you cited the uh, cost. I think of the two uh, uh, A as being uh, twenty four million, almost twice as much as, as the cost of the one uh, B. Um, is that just lumping together development and unit costs? Because I always wonder when people cite those numbers. No, I, uh, I, does it... I, I think that's the, the cost to buy. I think that that doesn't include, I believe that does not include the sunk costs. That's the cost to, you'd have to pay to get them to build an additional one. Uh, really, and it's twice as much as for the for the uh, <clears throat> 1B. Yes. And do you understand why that is, George? What's so much more expensive? Are they considerably bigger? Well, I think most of the cost of these things is in the kill vehicle. So it's a considerably more sophisticated kill vehicle. Uh -huh. You know, bear in mind the kill vehicle for the NMD interceptor alone is like $35 million. Okay. Uh, another question uh, uh, for the uh, to, to go to the, the uh, higher intercept speed of the, the 2B. Uh, does that require such a larger missile that it might not fit into the VLS system? It is a larger missile, but it does fit into the VLS. The mm -hmm. the the block 1B and 1A do not use the full diameter. Only part of the missile body uses the full diameter of the of the launch cell. The 2A, the whole missile uses the full diameter. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, Elizabeth, do you want to ask your question? I've just unmuted you. Uh, we're not hearing you. Well, I can see your question. Okay, all right. So, so the question it is says how this, many, yeah, go ahead. Um, I haven't really thought that through. It depends on, I'm assuming if you wanted to defend against them in terminal phase, you would want enough to keep at least one ship on station. Uh, so I presume that would probably mean four on each coast. So you might need as many as eight. If you take the fact that the European uh, employment has four ships to basically keep one in on post. Okay. Uh, Ivanka, do you want to ask your question? Not clear she's hooked up, but as you see it says, uh, Russia's concerned about the multi-purpose nature of BMD systems like Aegis Ashore. Sergey Rogoff made a proposal for the U.S. to modify the launch tube so that they can only be used for SM-3s and she wonders if that's technically feasible. Um, yeah, just to be clear, right now the the hardware of Aegis Ashore is identical to that on the ships. So the only reason they can't launch um, things other than the SM3s is the software. Um, it might be feasible. Um, you know, but it's not something, it wouldn't be something that, would, I, I don't think there's a way to do it. I don't, you know, and I haven't thought deeply about this. I don't think there's a way to do it that would be verifiable from the outside. It would have to be something having to do with connectors or something. But the, they, there's, you can't shrink the tubes or something because all these things are designed to use pretty much the full diameter of the tube. And George, do you understand what Rogov's concern is? Is it is it putting like a GBI or you know putting tom that they're going to put tomahawks in there? Oh, it's the con cruise missile concern. I see. Yes, yeah. it's the INF. It's their INF accusation. Right. Okay. Um, I I don't see anything else, but I have I have one more question, which is uh, when you've been looking at um, uh, sort of reactions to this from China. I'm, I'm curious what kind of, um, 
you know, what what their biggest concern is. Has it been concern about these things being used in a Taiwan situation? Has it been the U.S. Japanese co-development, or have they talked about the, the potential use as a, a strategic defense for the U.S. home? I mean, it's all of those. I don't I don't get one primary message. I mean, I really haven't talked to all that many Chinese about it, but I don't get a coherent focused message from them on this yet. Uh, Gregory, I just unmuted you. Do you have a, anything to say about that? Only that I don't think the Taiwan scenario is one where this comes up, at least I don't see it coming up. Um, it mainly comes up in the strategic defense. If, you know, the one thing with Taiwan is that, is that, um, if we were going to sell Taiwan a controversial system, it's probably going to be bad. Uh -huh. I'm, not, I'm not saying that we're going to do that, but if we were going to do an upper tier system, it would probably be sad. I mean, Japan is now thinking about buying sad in addition to Aegis. Mm -hmm. and, and what's the reasoning on that? It's just an additional layer. Oh, okay. And, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it it avoids tying their ships down. Uh huh. Uh, another question from Ivanka: Are you concerned about Russia's evolving aerospace defense capability? Uh, I'm not. Even, I'm not sure what that question means. I don't know hardly anything about Russia's aerospace defense capability. Um, so I, I just don't have an answer to that. Okay. I mean, it's it's. She could be more explosive, maybe I could, but I, I don't I really follow what Russia's doing and that kind of stuff very closely. Okay. I mean, I think one of the interesting things you point out about this is that in terms of the um, uh, anti-satellite capability of this, it's also going to be a big deal. Oh, uh, yeah, well, it's already a big deal. Yeah, and you're going to have, uh, you know, these uh, essentially direct descent ASATs uh, deployable essentially around the globe. No, you're going to have them deployed around the globe. Right. So, uh, are there any other questions? Okay. Without seeing that, um, thank you, George. Okay. Um, the uh, the plan is for uh, in um, January for uh, Laura Grego to give a talk about the uh, report that she and George and I did together, looking at at sort of the uh, current uh, ground-based missile defense system the U.S. has and, and the shape that it's in and what's happened over the almost 15 years of uh, development and, and deployment of that system. So those of you who are interested in missile defense, uh, stay tuned for that. So again, sorry for the technical problems, and uh, thanks for, for joining us today. Okay, bye.